Alright. Rock and roll, baby. It's three sides of the coin. One, two, three. <laughs> this is our new symbol. <laughs> Flash this anywhere, and you'll be known as a member of the three sides army. Three sides of the coin. <laughs> Oh, no, man. today we uh, <laughs> oh, cool, yeah, yeah. Cool, cool guest. We uh, we we are the road crew. Let's just leave it mm -hmm. at that. We are the yeah. road crew. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys will like this one. Yeah, this was fun. This was my minutia. There's plenty of it. Be part of Three Sides of the Coin. Leave a video message for us. Head over to threesidesofthecoin.com, click on the video message link, and record your three-minute video. Hey everybody, welcome back to Three Sides of the Coin. This is my KISS talk show, and I would like to welcome my co-host, Tommy Summers. Yes. <laughs> you are so well trained. Hey, you know. I don't even have to give you a cue anymore. Nope. <laughs> no, seriously, welcome to our show. Yes. And Tommy, as you know, is uh, one half of this, my co-host who's up in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. How are you today, Mike? Good, 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 good. We are going to have a fun show today. Um, before we get too deep into things, let's get back to, we, we didn't have housekeeping last week. Yes. So I'm going to do some housekeeping. Ha. Ha ha, people. This ha. is where you hit the little double arrow or FF, yeah. and we'll see you on the other side if that's what you're doing right now. Um, no, we appreciate everything you guys are doing for us. Um, I want to actually do a little different here. I'm going to do a shout out to the people who have made donations to us this month. And I really want to try and do this on a regular basis. Okay. Um, so we've had donations from Bjorn Steiner, Yo Johnson, Michael Harris, Anthony Lascalzo, Lonnie, Lonnie, hey Lonnie, thanks, um, Adrian Poole, Alexander Evans. So two, four, six donations so far. You guys are awesome. Um, oh, I actually forgot. There was one more, and I'm going to slaughter names here because we've got fans all over the world. Hakan Whitting. H-A-K-O-N Whitting. Um, head over to threesidesofthecoin.com, our website. You'll find links. You can make donations of whatever amount you want. Um, it goes into things like guitar picks it goes into something like i'm creating i hired a video editor to create a little new flashy cool movement video intro for three sides of the coin hopefully it'll Very be cool. you actually if it's done in time you've actually seen it on this show so the intro you just saw was something that i went out and hired somebody to create for us um, excellent but no, your donations mean a lot to us. It's very cool. It's going to help us with anything that we do for this show. The show will always be free, but your donations are appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Head over to Google Play and the iTunes App Store. Download our free app. We've got apps. For, I'm sorry we don't have apps for Windows phones, but we have Android and iOS apps, and that's pretty much everybody that's out there. If you're on a Windows, get off of it and get yourself an Android or get yourself an iPhone. Um, free app. You can listen to our show. Interestingly enough, most of the listens that come through Spreaker, which is now our number two source of people listening to the show after YouTube, are on smartphone apps. They're either listening wow. on, on our iPhone app or our Google Google Android app. So that's and, pretty cool that, that people are doing it mobile. 
Well, and also, too, I'd love to hear from some of you listeners as to if you prefer speak, Spreaker over, say, iTunes, why? What what format and why do you like certain ones? Because we want to keep working on it to keep it making it better and build on stuff for you to make it as easy as possible. Or, or, or if there's something else that we're not available on that you would be interested. I mean, I make no yeah. promises. Like, but we'll try. Um, you know, right now a Windows phone app isn't going to happen because I don't know anybody who would produce one for us. But if right. you want to make one, let us know. But if there's another outlet that we should be streaming on, let us know. But, um, you know, our big three are YouTube, iTunes, and Spreaker. And that's just based on numbers. You know, we can, mm -hmm. look, at, we can look at stats for each show, and that's the stats that are coming in. Okay. Works so, for me. So, yeah, go download the app. Leave a review. Leave a rating. Um, while you're in iTunes, rate and review our podcast in iTunes as well. You don't have to listen to it in iTunes. You can still just... Leave a review. So that's it for housekeeping. Okay. You got any comments for us this week? Yeah, I actually have a couple of different ones. Um, I haven't had a chance today to go through the latest episode, which is um, the one where we are with Mark Cicchini talking about collecting KISS stuff. So I want to hand out the very first Joey Middleton Award. Yes. To Nicholas Buckland, okay, and I better make sure I say this so that From he doesn't every, bum out on me. EverythingKiss.com. <laughs> exactly. EverythingKiss.com. Uh, he goes into great detail on um, the solo album topics, which was, what, 87, I, I think? think so, yeah. Yeah, so you can find it there uh, under Facebook. He, he goes into uh, detail about the different... Um, songs from each member and all of that so he gets a joy middleton award and i then don't know the what that other... award is but you got bragging rights there nicholas yeah you're the very first one so you know take it for what it is uh and then the other one i'm going to mention two different people who i've already highlighted but i was just so ridiculously impressed by both of them and i want to also say shout out to er each and every one of you who really took it to a different level and again I'm happy with a short little comment about these are the 10 songs that I would pick to put on the solo albums, okay? But some of the artwork that we received from everybody was just mind-blowing where you guys did the front and back covers and the, the credits and, and all of that. And But there's two in particular that I want to name because it's really important. And you can find this under Facebook again. You can either find them under the discussion of the show or a day or so after I posted a bunch of the artwork and then their two comments. So big props to Cameron. I think it's uh, Garifani and he goes through and does all of his um, four sides and then talks about all of the different things um, that, that he would is, put is, together with this. Is that the one that goes into detail about the success of the first single and the success of the second single and no, the reviews no, of the album? No, that's Telescreen. Okay. And I and I can't remember if that came from, from Facebook or if it came from YouTube. But again, both of these guys or gals sent in artwork and they went into detail. And yeah, like Mike was saying, the second one, Telescreen, he goes into like highest chart position. Ma makes on, up was, chart positions, <laughs> reviews by magazines. I mean, I was blown away. I'm like, yeah. he... he, he completely created a world the entire world around this release so i want to give joey middleton awards to both of these guys oh, as wow. well because yeah three it, joey middleton awards boom yeah because they were just and like i said it i love the uh interaction and and so before someone jumps down my throat about well you know what do you have to make a comment that's like eight pages long no we don't care we just want you engaged but the reason that these are so impressive is i know how long it takes just to write a good email right. at work and then to take the time to physically go through this because you're liking what mike and i are doing is like the highest compliment you can give us and in addition when people do this it also creates other opportunities for people to share with everyone right. what they think and it just spurs discussions because Mike and I are doing this for ourselves we're doing this because we enjoy it but what we enjoy about it is is all of you guys liking it and talking about it the discussions are phenomenal 
Yeah. So yeah. thank you. So thank you. Hey, Chris Medic, how about creating a graphic for the Joey Middleton Award? Perfect. Yes, Chris. So we, thank so, you. So, so, so we can we can at least send the winners a graphic that they can put on their Facebook page. Well, we can tag the photo. Like if I find it on Facebook and we're going to give it, we'll just pop it right I on that. I have no one. idea what it would be, Chris. You can you can message Joey Middleton and you can figure something out between you guys. And yeah. Create a little graphic of the Joey Middleton Award and we'll send that. Maybe to like Joey. a yeah, maybe a caricature of Joey or something. I don't. I don't. Know. I don't know. Figure it out. Yeah. You're always good yeah. at that stuff. Um, so I want to play another voicemail that came in. And this is from Stephen Howard from Lexington, Kentucky. It's it's about, um, how long is it? It's about a, just over a minute long. And, uh, you know, it was a nice, interesting, fun voicemail. I'll play it right now. You can listen to it, and then we'll, uh, we'll do a little comment. Hey, Mike. Hey, uh, Tommy. How you doing? This is uh, Stephen Howard from uh, Lexington, Kentucky. I uh, just want to let you know that I was on vacation recently in uh, the uh, Connecticut area, uh, Bridgeport uh, specifically, and went to see one of my uh, favorite bands, uh, a band called Humphreys McGee, and I was wearing my Three Sides of the Coin t-shirt uh, that a friend got me and ended up being recognized by a group of people there that knew the show and uh, watched it and were fans. And uh, even though we were there celebrating the Humphreys McGee, the band we were seeing, uh, there ended up being a group of about 20 or 30 people that hung out and watched the show as Kiss fans. Um, all because of, I, I really believe it was because of Three Sides of the Coin. Uh, I just thought you might want to know that. I thought it was pretty cool. And uh, so keep up the good work. And i uh waiting for the next episode. Thanks, guys. Bye. So, three sides of the coin is everywhere. <laughs> That's fantastic, and thank you so much for calling in. We'd love to hear stuff like that. Again, it's about making friends and connections with people. How cool is that? You go to a show, you don't know anybody, you're wearing a shirt, and boom, all of a sudden you're hanging with 20 yeah, people. Yeah, I, love, I, just, I thought that was fun. That was just very cool that, that our show brought some people together. Awesome. So Love th it. thanks, Stephen. That was very cool. And um, anybody else who has voicemails that you want to leave for us, you can call us. Hold on. Let me pull up my notes here. 1 320 It's a regular phone number. Whatever toll charges might apply if you have to pay, it's up to you. But again, you can call 1-320-515-4771 and leave us a voicemail message. And uh, maybe it'll make it on one of these upcoming shows. So I want to, what, what would a three sides of the coin be without a little rant about fans? Because that is the point of this show from the very To beginning. rant about the fans. <laughs> so... I made a post, which I thought, honest to God, was just an innocent post. Shared There's a no such thing. Shared a tweet that Paul Stanley made. Now, granted, let's keep in mind. All right, the tweet. Fan asked Paul, would Eric Carr still be in the band if he was alive? And Paul replied with, probably not for many reasons. That was it. Five words. Mm-hmm. And I just thought that was interesting, more so to the fact that the tweet was already, outside of three sides of the coin world, starting to stir things up amongst fans. But we had just done an episode about that very same topic a couple episodes earlier, where we talked about what if Eric Carr was still alive. We did a whole show about this. Mm -hmm. I share the tweet, and frickin' things explode! <laughs> And he's not stirring the pot. I'm I telling you. I was not you, stirring was the just... pot. I was just like, it's interesting because Paul Stanley's answering a question. I felt he was answering very honestly. It was a question that I'm sure he gets asked many, many times because I know you and I get that question all the time. That's why we finally did that what if. 
that's was the first to what if, wasn't it? I think it was because yeah, we got all the time we're asked, "What if Eric Carr hadn't died? What happened?" And it was just like, dude, we don't want to. Okay, we're finally going to answer that, and this will be our very first one. So I thought it was just interesting that Paul probably gets that question a lot too, and I felt it was a really kind of honest and straightforward answer no disrespect by paul nothing it's just like no probably not for many reasons yeah there's many reasons we don't know about it it wasn't a definitive yes or no it was a probably not meaning he doesn't know but probably not and let's be honest i think it's you know if you read paul's book he talks about you know the end there with eric and how things ended and how he's a little shocked the way it was handled, and we got more reaction to me sharing that freaking tweet than we did to the whole episode we did. Right. And, that, and that's what just floored me. It's like, wait a second, we spent over an hour talking about this, and I got a little bit of flack, but I share a five-word tweet, and I'm called disrespectful. Yeah, you're like Hitler or something. I was just that. like, are you freaking kidding me then you're damned if you do damned if you don't you know and, and people were going off and calling paul names and and it was just like dude what what are you guys talking about well he's jealous how do you get jealous out of five words <laughs> he was honest it's like you want him to answer the question and if you answers it honestly you hate it if he doesn't answer it you call you him hate a liar it. Yeah, <laughs> I was just like, and then, then they were like, he could have gone into greater explanation. It was on frickin' Twitter. He had, I think, 34 <laughs> characters to answer the question. Uh, what are you going to do, people? I mean, it's just... Yeah. I, I, I suppose they, just, wanted, they wanted five or ten tweets after that detailing, detailing each reason. Yeah. What what were the many reasons? Like Like... You would believe his many reasons. You don't believe what he just said. Right, yeah. Then, then that's all going to be, he's not telling us the truth. That's not true. You know? I mean, there were <laughs> yeah. actually a couple fans who said, no, he's not. He's he's wrong. What? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, the fan, know what would have happened. Paul Stanley, in the band, in there as it happened, is wrong in saying what would have happened. You guys are freaking nuts sometimes. <laughs> And and oh, and boy. and this wasn't this wasn't pissing me off. It was more of I was rolling in laughter, going, "Are you really freaking saying that?" Mm. I don't even know what to say. I don't, I, just like I don't know. It was just it was too much. It felt like I was <sighs> dealing with some Vinnie Vincent fans. <laughs> Maybe you were. Um, hey, be. I thought of something else too. I want to share um, while we're doing this. Now, by the time you guys see this. Uh, I will have seen the show because it's coming up this coming Sunday, the oh, 17th. Right. So we're, well, this will be broadcast that following Tuesday. But in the Minneapolis Star Tribune today, Whoa. this is in the variety section. Okay. And look at what it says. Not so mean Gene. Now, huh. I have not read this yet because I'm at work. Who's, and who's, somebody, who's the author of the article? John if it's Breen? John Breen. If it's John Breen, we're in trouble. No, uh, Chris Ryman Snyder, oh, wow. and he works from the Star Tribune, so it's possible. But you know, it's really quite a nice layout. He they get the front and the back cover. Wow. Yeah, I have to send this to Chikini. He'll want this. So, anyways, um, go to uh, the uh, Minneapolis Star Tribune dot com, and I'm sure by the time you guys see this, you can probably read through the whole thing online. But really cool pictures, and it's two pages worth of Did, didn't uh, we stuff. do a whole episode about how Gene's not so mean anymore? Basically, we said yeah. he's not the demon. He's not the demon, I and mean, I'm sure they're talking about how the attendance um, for the shows this summer are record low. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> The only people coming are Def Leppard fans. Yeah, exactly. Who is this Kiss fan? In Minneapolis, there's going to be 19,000 Def Leppard fans and Tommy. (laughs) Hey, I'm going with, I know, I'm going with Bren. Okay, two Kiss fans. (laughs) Two Kiss fans, yeah. All right, so we got a special guest today. We've been 
juggling special guests for like a month because things happen. And we had one today. We're supposed to have one next week, which should be very cool. And there's another one coming up in a couple weeks after that as well. Um, this week, we have Ken Barr. And for those of you who don't know, Ken is, is or was a KISS roadie. He wrote a book called We Are the Road Crew. And he was Eric Singer's tech from 92. Is that what he said? 92 to the first. He, he left after Weenie Roast. Obviously, yeah, he wasn't. He was tech, also, obviously, he wasn't. He wasn't teching for Peter, but he had different roles. But he. But he's he'd known Eric longer. He'd known Eric longer than that. So anyway, he goes into his history of 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 how he became a roadie, um, how he hooked up with Eric the first time, being on the road with Kiss. The what what a somebody like his job being Eric's road 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 dog road crew you know whatever you want to call him. Um, what did they do day to, day in and day out? It's a very cool interview. I loved it because this is the type of stuff that I just, I, I love this stuff. Some people get off on analyzing every single song and the recordings in the studio. I, there's something about the shows, how the shows are put together, who's doing it. I mean, uh, whenever I go to concerts, I'm always eyeballing the sides of the stages watching what's going on by the crew guys i'm just amazed by what they do and and the hard work these guys put in so ken takes us through a lot of that yep so hopefully you'll uh you'll get a kick out of this just as much as we do we spend about an hour with ken talking about being a road crew so mm -hmm. here you go give it a listen so let's welcome Ken Barr, our special guest this week. Ken, um, I know who you are. I've read your book. But why don't you give all the KISS fans your five-minute bio as to who you are in the KISS world and why you're here? Okay, well, I'm here because I was fortunate enough to be asked. Uh, my name's Ken Barr. I worked for KISS. I was fortunate enough to work for KISS from... 1992, I came in as Eric Singer's drum tech. I'd been on the road with him for quite a while, and I came in as part of the package. And I stayed with the band through the beginning of the uh, reunion tour in 96. Um, on the convention tour, I was also Gene's bass tech. And for anybody that saw the MTV Unplugged, which really started the whole thing all over again for those guys, I was Peter's tech, Eric's tech, and Gene's tech. And... It was a, a great experience. I was started out a Kiss fan, and still am a Kiss fan. So, so you've also written a book about your stories as as a roadie, as a, on the road crew, right? Yeah, we are the road crew. Available on Amazon, Kindle, and iTunes. Okay. <laughs> and and do you have, do you have a website for it, or just go find it on Amazon, Kindle, or iTunes? I started out with a website, and I've done so many other things. Um, I I just it, it's not worth it. Okay. So just do a, a Google search. It'll come up on five different things, and it's um, easily accessible. I've I've read the book. I okay. read it. it. It came out, what, a year and a half ago maybe? Four Actually, ago? about four years ago. Four years, four years ago. ago. I read it when uh, it my first, first came out. Yeah, my first publisher was smaller, and... I was not on Amazon. I was on their spot, the cafe press only. It was very hard to find. But at the time, that was my only option. Self-publishing has changed since then. And my current publisher, you sign with them, you're on Amazon, you're on Kindle, and it just it makes everything more accessible. So it's been a little over four years. So, I mean, I would just say to KISS fans, go grab the book. It's a fun read. It's got some cool road stories. I think, you know, speaking as a KISS fan, that's sort of the side of – of Kiss that I know I'm much more interested in. I'm kind of burnt out on hearing the band tell the same story 20 million times. I want to hear the stories from the people who kind of put the band there. Get the title I know, again, I know please, what Ken. you're saying. You know, we hear about the loft. I mean, no disrespect, but we, you know, if you're a true fan, you know all the stories. 
I don't need to hear them again and again. Yeah. Uh, I definitely get that. I remember reading in Circus Magazine in the 70s these same stories. <laughs> and, you know, you buy a book and then you buy another book. And it's okay. I respect that. But, yeah, the, the stories do kind of, you know, there's only so much to tell. Right. And right. telling it five times doesn't make it fresh or new. Um, Can you give the so title yeah, again? I'm sorry? Can you give the title again, Ken? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, uh, of the book? Yes. We are the road crew. Uh, okay, and I know we are I've, the road I've, crew, everybody. Yeah, so, yeah I've, I've had some people ask why I wrote a book about my years on the road because it was my first book. And I didn't what, – starting out, I didn't know if I could write a book. So I didn't want to ask any of my old road buddies, hey, have you got stories from my book? Because if you don't complete it, you feel not so great. So the reason it's we are the road crew is that even though it's my book about my days, it's out of respect because no one does it alone. It's a crew. Right. Everyone's out there doing a job. Everyone's out there doing a really good job, a difficult job. So it's always a brotherhood. And even in that first book, which I hope to do more, it was important to me to acknowledge that it's not about me only. You know, I was a small part of a big machine. So that's why we are the road crew. So, so, so let me get into some of your history. So how did you get started um, working in a road crew? I mean, what, how old were you? Where were you? This isn't just so people know, because I get this question every once in a while, whether it's through KISS or just my music marketing business. People are like, yeah, I'd like to apply for a job as a, as a road crew. And, it, it, you know, this isn't like yeah. you go to Craigslist or, or something like that and find an application and fill it out. How did it happen? It's funny. I, now you would go to school for it because they have schools like Full Sail and, and, and things like that. They didn't have that back when I started. Um, like most guys my age, most guys my generation, started as a really not so good musician. And when you have the, the cognizance to realize, hey, I'm not very good at this and I don't seem to be getting any better. What are my options? And some guys gravitate to sound, some guys to lights. At that early entry, doing bars when you're a teenager, you do it all. And that's pretty much what I did. There were four or five bands in the high school I was going to. And there was really only one or two working man kind of bars to play. They weren't even rock clubs. And we would talk the owners into letting somebody play. And whoever was playing, everybody else was carrying milk crates full of stuff. Uh, to help and to also avoid the $2 cover charge because saying <laughs> I'm with the band right. will always get you out of that cover charge. Right. And that's that's how it yep. started. Homemade lights, a yep. PA borrowed from the high school. I'm sorry? I thought I, thought I was cutting somebody no, off. No, there. no, no, no. no. So, so, a PA borrowed from the high school, um, and you just did it. You know, There were no guitar techs, and you know, you'd help set up the amps and drums and everybody even the band pitched in everybody did everything and where i grew up uh, long island at the time in the mid to late 70s the bar scene the club scene was growing and was getting uh, if you've heard of well, i'm sure you have you know the, the legend of twisted sister playing thousand seat clubs yep. band the bands that had come before us on long island grew their audiences to that level where clubs of that magnitude existed. You know, you could do a 500 seat club on a Tuesday and the music scene insane. was such that you could do that. It was, it was really, it was a great place to grow up. Uh, to, there was a good band playing seven nights a week and, you know, bars from a hundred people to a thousand people. So you really had a broad range and you also had those goals to get, from working for that band at a, at a hundred seats to get to that band of a thousand seats, and one of my early goals goals was to work for the bigger bands on Long Island. Um, you know, there was a band called Rough Cut and a band called Cintron, and those were my big goals. And it's funny because Tommy Henriksen, who was in that band Rough Cut, has been in Alice Cooper's band the past three years, and he co-produced Welcome to My Nightmare. You know, it, it's great to see these guys I grew up with go out and really kick some ass themselves. But that's how it started. It, it was just working my way up the food chain on the club circuit. Uh, you know, from the time I was 15 till my early 20s, it was a day job. You know, whatever day job you could have that gave you the, the flexibility. I used to work at a car lot changing oil and installing radios because if I had to leave it to in the afternoon to go do a gig, it was okay. It was no big deal. So 
uh, not the greatest job changing oil in the snow up in New York, but you know, it enabled me to go and be at the rock club and set up the lights and do whatever it is I had to do. Because the, the the gigs they paid a little bit, but it was a little bit, not enough to live on. Let so, me ask you a question. Well, Ken, oh. can I ask you a question? Not to switch gears on you here, because this is a kiss thing. But um, regarding Twisted Sister, since you were there and seeing that that rise that they had and filling these larger clubs that just don't exist anymore, was there a sense around that people are like, why are these guys not signed to uh, a label? There was a huge sense of that. Even t- I would say the the local fans were almost outraged. It was. They were one of the best bar bands there were. D. Snyder is a great front man, always has been, always will be. And they, they, the truth is they should have gotten signed earlier, and I don't know why. But when you've got a band commanding in the, the tri-state area, well, they're commanding a 1,000 people a night, sometimes more. There was one concert they did. It was a, an outdoor uh, small theme park. They did 10,000 people. And that's undeniable. They sh- they should have been given the support. They should have been given the opportunity because they could have built their fan base a lot earlier, a lot stronger. And they didn't really get that chance. No, it's the industry. It, it is what it is. People have their reasons, but they were right. they were one of those bands that they they were there. You felt a part of it. They were with you. you we were all one big gang, and you know it's all rock and roll. And those guys live. These. They, there was really no stopping them back then. So, so you said cool. um, you were with Eric Singer before Kiss, right? So not as his tech. We were touring together on Alice Cooper, but okay. I was not his drum tech. I can uh, I can get to the Eric Singer and back it. I'll have to back it up. Sure, just sure, a little please, bit, though, please do. Okay. Sure. Well, one of my first real tours was with a Long Island singer named Debbie Gibson. Believe it or not, oh, yeah. that was my big break in the business. And I was cool. hired as a drum slash percussion tech, and I had the the good fortune of having musicians that knew, yes, he's a hard worker. No, he doesn't know drums. He doesn't know percussion. We're going to teach him, and that's what happened. And I I had the good fortune to learn how to tune drums, how to learn the instruments, how to do it all. And when we went out on tour, I was prepared for that. Although another sidebar. You know, we, uh, we loaded into our first arena on that tour, and it was up in Worcester, Massachusetts, and I was scared to death. I said, who am I kidding? I can't do arenas. <laughs> and uh, Lou Appel, the drummer, um, God rest his soul, he's uh, no longer with us. He was like a big brother to me on that tour, and he said, just relax. It's going to be fine. You're being stupid. That was his advice. And I sucked it up, got through the first show, scared to death, and made it. And uh, I did survive, and he was right. So anyway, um, I met Eric Singer when I was on that tour. Uh, we crisscrossed with Badlands, and I was old friends with, from the club's, uh, his drum tech at the time, a guy named Ralph. So they came to one of our shows because our keyboard player had played in Paul Stanley's solo band with Eric Singer. So there's, you know, always a lot of six, knowing six, each other. Six degrees of kiss separation there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, because yeah, Eric had done the, the Paul Stanley solo club tour with Gary Corbett, the keyboard player, who was touring with me and Debbie Gibson's band. So I, that's where I met Eric. The next time I saw him was in January of 1990. Uh, Jonathan Mover had decided he was going back with Joe Satriani, and he, we Alice needed a new drummer. The Trash Tour was a big tour for that year. It was a big tour for Alice, and... You know, so we held auditions. There were uh, three people were invited. Uh, a guy named Chuck, who I don't recall. He was a friend of the bass players. Uh, Jimmy DeGrasso, who Megadeth, Black, uh, Black, oh God, Black Star Riders. I'm sorry. I love that band. Okay. Um, and Eric Singer. I actually helped Eric set up his drums. We talked, and at the end of the day, it was easy. It was obvious to tell Eric was getting the gig, and he did. So he, we toured together. I was working for Al Petrelli and Derek Sherinian, which was a handful. That was back in the days of three guitar racks and more keyboards and more is better and right, you know, right. big rigs. And just the, uh, yeah. So, and so, it was a so, handful. So, so even there, each guy didn't have their own personal tech? You were, you were handling a couple guys? Uh, Alice Cooper traditionally has a stage right for guitar and key. Uh, I'm sorry, for guitar and bass. Stage left for guitar, keys, or guitar, and second guitar, and a drum tech. 
And all my tours with Alice, I did a couple of, you know, two guys used typically, which it's good. You make a few extra dollars. It's easier for them. And if you're good, you can make it happen. It, you know, you, you work it out. Sure. But, well, it um, makes sense that they want someone that can multitask also to, you know, fill in. Yeah, over the years, I've done everything with Alice bass, keyboards, drums, whatever needed to be done, a stage managed. And it is good to be able to multitask. The fact that I could program keyboards or tune a drum properly kept me in work over the years. So um, anyway, on the Alice Cooper tours, I did two tours, the, the 1990 Trash and the 1991 Hey Stupid tours with Eric Singer. And there were times his drum techs were not so good, and I'd actually help out a little bit here and there just to make it happen. And when we were on tour in Europe, his drum tech had actually bailed right before Europe, so we just had a pickup guy for that last European tour in 91, which made it, his decision even easier. When he got the call, which was in the fall of, of 91, right after Eric Carr passed, um, he, we went out to dinner, and I knew something was up. And we we talked. He, you know, he danced around it, and eventually he said, "Hey, I've gotten the call. I am going to be the next drummer in Kiss, and I'd like you to be my drum tech. I'd like to bring you in with me." I agreed wow. right there. Yeah, and uh, that you know, the next day I think is when my homework started. I took pictures of his drums. I started really paying close attention, so that when the time came, I would be ready. And we started talking, and we started making plans. Um, the NAM show was coming up in January. We were going to be home in December. So we decided that I'd fly out the NAM North American Music Merchants. It's the big show, demo, yep. new equipment. And Eric wanted me to meet his vendors because he, he stayed with Zildjian and Pearl, I think, since day one. He's loyal, and they're, they've been great companies for him. So I went out to NAM. I stayed at his house, and... Um, met his vendors and and that's how it started and since you know you guys have men have mentioned that you, you'd like the stories that you don't normally hear i can tell you one story about staying at eric's house is um i'm a big star trek fan and after a couple originals of days originals or next gen originals first i give respect to next generation but you can't top the original you just can't i grew I'm, up with I'm, that. I'm completely opposite of that <laughs> Okay, well, you know what? There's enough Star Trek for everybody. But the thing was, is um, after about two or three days, he said, oh, yeah, Chekhov lives across the street. Walter Koenig lived across the street from him, and he for didn't mention it for like three days. Cause I, think, <laughs> I think he knew I was going to be a stalker or steal mail or something. <laughs> so from then on, every morning, it was up at the crack of dawn and looking out the, the living room window waiting for Walter to come get his newspaper, which I never spotted him. Ah. Uh. So uh, that's so, my. So just go over and knock on the door. I debated it, but since Eric was his neighbor, you don't want to be too weird or too. You, know, you just you know, yeah. it's not your house. It's kind of. Oh, I know. I just had to. I just had to ask. You know. Oh, I I thought about it. I did think about it, but so, I. So um, Ken, let, let me let me ask you when when a when a musician finds a tech, um, how common is it that they kind of stay together wherever you know so if that musician jumps band does he bring the tech with them i mean is it do you guys build a real close relationship that you kind of just follow them that that really depends on the situation uh, and and a lot of times it's not up to the musician himself um you know there are times eric was was with kiss but there wasn't any work for me, and I went. I was guitar tech for Stone Temple Pilots in '94. I, you know, you, you have to work. Sure, sure. And then if you become sure, obligated right. to, and, and what a lot of times happens is, you you, you accept a tour, so like uh, I'll use Stone Temple Pilots as an example, and then you know you're committed to for six months, but then Kiss comes up with four shows in South America, and you can't do them, mm -hmm. so they get they get somebody to cover you. Well, One let thing, me ask you um, something. Go ahead. I just I don't want to forget to ask some of these questions because this stuff is fantastic you're sharing. Um, since you're a Kiss fan and yes. you're obviously you're friends with Eric, you worked for Eric for a number of years, you've been on the Kiss tours and all the stuff that we're talking about. What's your personal feelings on the whole thing with Eric wearing the cat makeup? I I that's that's a tough one, but but um 
let me see here. I want to want to speak correctly. There is as as anyone that is a Kiss fan, we we love Kiss. We love the original Kiss. Period. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. that's you know, that's a fact. For whatever the reasons, and since I was never in the room when decisions were made, those four guys can't seem to play together. So what do we want? We obviously want as much of that as we can get. So Eric wearing the makeup, mm -hmm. he's the guy. He was well, in the band for years. If you're going to – you know, people need a Peter Chris. Well, not a – I'm sorry. I just misspoke, which I didn't want it to. People want those four iconic faces. You know, um, The other two – Maybe this is my own opinion, but anything else, you know, Vinnie Vincent's onk, Eric Carr, God bless him, but the Fox, those just never caught on. Those first first four, mm -hmm. the original four are iconic, and you have to have them if you're going to put that show on. You really do. And well, I can't and that's, Go ahead. No, and I think that's that's great because that's kind of the, the, the stance that Mike and I have taken because I really – I like them and what they're doing now. It doesn't mean that I don't love the original four. We've said this more than, than yeah. once. And, but Eric, I think Eric Singer and Tommy Thayer are both great musicians, and they take the band to a different place. You know, So they for me, I don't have an issue with it. Those two guys are spot on. They're great musicians. They are pushing themselves every time I see them. They're pushing themselves a little harder, a little further musically. And you have to respect that. So mm -hmm. they're – you know. I think that having younger guys, especially Eric's personality, he's like the chihuahua nipping at the heels. He just never stops. He's the energizer bunny. He's always da -da 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 doing something. And I think that keeps them from becoming complacent. He is the, the, the main spark. He's the main spark plug in that engine to me because he just pushes harder, never stops, and he's just always, always into something, up to something. And just going. I believe it was he that was – he was pushing to do Beth. You know, he's pushed to do different right. songs, and he's not afraid to try it. And I think that's why he succeeds is because he's got the balls to just say, hey, let's do it. Why not? Right. Let, 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 right. let, me, let me go back to the relationship between the musician and the tech. So how okay. often does a band say this is going to be your tech? Does that ever happen? It happens, and again, it, it depends on the situation. Like, Guns N' Roses had their crew from day one. Long after Duff had moved up to Seattle, McBob was still getting a paycheck every week. And if Duff had ever needed him, he'd have been there. I did, uh, McBob filled in a couple of Alice Cooper dates, one-offs. That's where I met him. He was still getting a paycheck, and Guns N' Roses hadn't played, Duff hadn't played in Guns in years. So it depends on the band. It depends on the situation. The Metallica guys have had most mainly the same crew since the early 80s. You know, Big Mick and some of those guys, they're legends themselves now. So it really depends. Like Alice Cooper, Alice Cooper doesn't – the band are all hired. So Alice Cooper organization has always been loyal to whoever did the last tour. When people came in the band, when I was a regular tech, they were told – Kenny Barr is the stage left guitar tech keyboard guy. If you can't work with that, we're very sorry, but he's our guy. Because to the organization, somebody that's going to show up for work, do the job well, not be a party or not be a pain in the ass, that's money in the bank. And they did not want to lose that. They were loyal. They were loyal to me and the loyalty I showed to them. The Alice Cooper organization, absolutely great. But again, that's Alice's choice to have the same people around him as much as possible. So, again, it really depends on the situation. Is the musician working enough to keep the guy on retainer? Because you have to work. you got to pay bills. So, like I said, right. you know, the super bands, a lot of them do. A lot of them do. But you don't really so, see it as so much as I'd like. I, 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 I don't want the specifics. And even if this question is, is too personal, just let me know. As a tech, like in your situation with KISS, are you paid by Eric Singer or are you paid by Kiss? Are you who, Kiss. Do, you, who do you work for? Okay. You work for Kiss. Actually, uh, it's funny. When I worked, it was long before the days of electronic banking. And Gene, you, I don't know if this is still true, but Gene used to sign, physically sign right. every check. Yeah. Every single check. He'd get a FedEx packet, packet out. He'd look them all over. He knew where every penny was going. He'd, and every one of my paychecks, um, 
was signed by Gene Simmons. So I, 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 they, I have a story back around the Hot in the Shade tour that I've told before where I, I, I was with a band that Gene was going to sign at the time to his Simmons Records back in the 80s. And he invited us, me and the band backstage to meet. And I distinctly remember seeing him sitting on the couch in his dressing room, going through a stack of checks, signing yep. them, signing them, stopping at one and going pulling like i don't know the tour manager somebody over and going why am i writing a check to this guy we fired him last week there you go <laughs> i yeah. mean it, i was just that was the big takeaway was like oh my god gene simmons is going on stage in like 45 minutes and here he is looking at and signing every single check related to that company's business i think in the in the 70s when things were just insane i think those guys really got robbed by people that should have been had should have had their better interests and right. gene gene learned he educated himself in what needed to be done and now he knows where every penny goes when he's off that stage he's on the phone he knows the t-shirt count before he's got he's in the shower yeah. i mean he knows right. all the numbers and you need that you really do um you know someone will steal from you if you don't keep an eye unfortunately you know when there's that much money around people they, they try to convince themselves it's okay. Oh, there's so much money. They won't miss this or that. Well, it's still stealing. I don't care if it's a nickel. And I'm mm -hmm. sure, you know, Gene would feel the same way. So I think it's it's to their best interest that they're not reliant on a third party that you may or may not trust. Gene knows at any any moment where the money is, where it, how much came in, how much went out. I'm sure it's a burden to have to do that, but I think he kind of enjoys it. He knows what's going on at all times. Yep. So, so um, I, go, go ahead, Tommy. Well, I had a question. Um, and this isn't like a specific personal question about Eric. This is more about working for him in KISS. Was there anything in doing your job for him in that band that was different from other tech jobs that you've had for different bands? Is there extra stuff that has to be done there than not other places? For Eric, yeah, Eric... Eric is a he's he's a precision drummer. He's he's like a to me like a Ferrari. And and you, okay. I'm going to preface myself because I'm going to sound like the president of the Eric Eric Singer fan club, which maybe I should be, but I respect the guy on an enormous level. But right. there were things he needed. First off, um, he sang backup vocals, and he was not comfortable wearing a headset mic. So I was up there moving the microphone into where he could sing. But because he's so physical with his drumming, I had to move it out so he wouldn't hit it with his arm. And if the set was 21 songs, he was singing back up on 20 of them. So right. there was a lot of swinging in. But because I was a Kiss fan, I knew the songs. So all I had to be told was this, what song is next. And I knew exactly what I needed. There was no rehearsal needed. Um, you know, Eric used to have a very particular way he liked his drumsticks um, shaved down, you know, so he could grip them when he got sweaty. Okay. So um, can you, can you, okay, can stop you there. Explain what that is to people. When you say shave down, what is the process? What do you do for him specifically? What we would have to do is because the, the drumsticks would come with a very, a good finish on them and a clear coat, you know, very sanded, perfect, clear coat. Well, your hands get slippery, smooth things fall out of them. So I would take a file and maybe eight inches from the bottom up, I would file it to a, a rough – I knew how he would like it. And it was something he could grip no matter how sweaty he was. It was just raw, unfinished wood with a rough edge to it. So those drumsticks would not come out of his hand because you get sweaty. You're up there. It's 110 degrees between the pyro, the lights, the lasers, the whole thing. It's hot as hell up there. Hotter than hell. Uh -huh. little song club. Uh -huh. And – um, so yeah, I need, I need a little symbol. So um, you know that that was important, um, and it's funny because where the the Kiss logo is on the drumsticks, when we first got them, he didn't want me to shave that for obvious reasons. You, you know, you don't want to take that away. And one of our early shows on the club tour, he just pointed at them and he said, "Shave those things up another four inches." And I was on the drum riser with him with a file, shaving those drumsticks up because there wasn't enough for him to grip. And we had to shave the, the first couple of boxes. We had to shave the KISS logo off to give him enough to grab and play. 
So when you toss them to the kids, they really didn't get a kiss souvenir, but it, you know, it was why, what it why, was. Why wouldn't Eric wear gloves? It's not him. And it's just, it's, it's not the player he is, you know, it's a personal preference and I don't really know why. I think he's just, you know, it's what he was used to. So, so kind of following up on Tommy's question, um, you're working for Kiss and Eric now. Is the Kiss organization, um, I don't know how to say this, a tighter run ship, a more strict ship than you've experienced with other bands and, and, and other artists you've worked out, that you've gone out on the road with? I didn't find it um, tight or strict at all. Uh, they're taskmasters. They expect you to do your job. They expect your job to be flawless every day. They are very professional, and they it will take you to task if things are not right. But I I got compliments from Gene Simmons, which is unheard of, so I never had an issue. Um, it was pretty much do your job, and everybody's happy. You know, anybody that couldn't do their job was soon departed. I, so when you – well, so then when you get hired – now, granted, you've had all the history, and you're saying now there are schools where you can take classes. So you go in and you get hired. And let's say they tell you that you're going to be Eric Strum Tech and you have never met Eric before. What happens first? You physically meet him face to face. You sit down and have a discussion. And what do you do? I mean, how do you get ready for a tour? What is your job? It would really uh, it, it depend on the musician. And I can give you an example. When I was hired to be the bass tech for the Bangles, that was the situation. We were brought in unknown to them, uh, a guitar tech and myself. And we met them at a rehearsal, and they didn't like us. They didn't want us. And we had to prove ourselves right then and right there, which meant getting the guitars out, getting them set up, and doing a, a rehearsal on the spot perfect. Um, what, what year was this? Because I love the Bengals. That was, so. that was 1989. The, um, I had toured <sighs> cool. with Steve Botting, who was married to the drummer. He was our production manager set slash sound oh, man. Okay. And when the, the, he was gearing up, he knew myself and, and the other guitar tech were people he wanted. So he was comfortable with us, and his word gave the, the girls the okay to hire us. But they were very, they were a very closed group. They'd had the same crew for quite a while prior to that, and they were a little resistant at first. And it took a couple days for them to kind of loosen up, and it was it was a prove yourself type thing. But as far as like if if I'd come into a, the Eric Singer thing, he would have you know we'd have talked about his drums. I'd have asked him what he likes. I'd have listened to his drums. I'd have gone through his road cases. I'd have seen his supplies, which means drum heads, which means snares, which means sticks. And you just a lot of questions. And that's, that's, you know, you have to be able to ask the right questions so that they know you know what you're doing. And, you know, if you start asking him what his favorite color is or can you get new road cases, you're not going to be very popular, but intelligent questions about the equipment and its maintenance and what he likes. Yeah, at that time, I think we were changing snare heads every other show, and that was his preference because he didn't like a new head every show, and he liked the way they sounded on the second show. There's certain ways of breaking snare heads in. There's certain ways of doing a lot of things with drums, and you, you just ask the right questions and, and instill confidence. I think you have to – it applies in any job. The, the musician is technically your boss. You know, Kiss paid me, but Eric was my boss. He had to be comfortable. He had to be confident. He can't be up there thinking about his drums and are they going to break. He needs to be able to play his songs without another thought in his head. And I gave him that confidence. So walk us through for, for fans who don't really know what your job would be at a show. The, 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 the trucks, the buses roll into a venue. Um, what do you, are you out there unloading the, the flight, the, the road cases and pushing them around? And are you, are you bolting the lighting rigs together and setting up the stage? What do you do? Well, backline guys, which are, uh, you know, guitar, guitar techs, drum techs, it's called backline. They are notoriously known for being kind of sleeping in. And I I worked two jobs my whole life, so I was always, people would laugh at me in the beginning of the tour, be like, "Why is the guitar tech out on the stage with the riggers?" You know, the riggers are the first ones in. They hang the motors from the steel ceiling that's going to lift your sound and light, so they're the first ones in. Period. 
I would be in with them because I'm awake I'm, and I love the arenas. I love walking in an arena. I love the process of the show going up and I would always be there. They would, they used to laugh and say, Kenny Barr is going to be backing in the catering truck because catering is there before we even we are. So the, typically backline guys don't usually get up until around 10 ish or so again, sometimes later. And, uh, but the way it works is rigging goes in first, then sound and lights, then the stage set, then backline is last, and we work kind of work around everybody because we, we, our stuff is smaller, it's more mobile. And on Kiss, I'd start working on Eric's drums, but I would also I'd take his drums out of the cases on the floor of the arena because his drums always had different kind of finishes, and I used to use this the same cleaner they use on race car windshields to do his drum shells. And I would, it would take about two hours just to clean them properly and then have a couple of stagehands do his cymbals. I'd change whatever drum heads needed to be changed. I'd stretch them. I'd do whatever I had to. I'd tune them. I'd do as much as I could so that when I got the stage, it would be ready. Because if sound and lights are having a tough day, you may not get the stage till 2.30 and the band are going to be in at four to sound check. So you got to be quick. You got to be just able to get up there quick and get it done if need be. And that would be the first part of my day. It'd be Eric walks in, his drums are perfect. And I'll use an analogy he gave me. You know, you ever get your car, the seat, the rear view mirror, the side view mirror, everything just how you like it, just perfect. That is how he described his drum kit. He wants it to be like that, where everything is just right there, right where he needs it to be. Which and, is one of the reasons and, why I would think he'd want to continue to work with you, because when you get to know him like that, he knows you know what he needs. You know, I, I, and I'm, I'm sure if circumstances had worked out different, you, I, you know, I was offered my job back when he got back in the band. In was that 2000 when they did Japan yeah. for the Olympics? Yeah. He called me first. And I, I at that point had decided I was married at the time and I had promised I would stay home. I was. Yep. I, I, I kick I kick myself. I would have loved to have done it, and it just it's you know. And I give Eric a lot of credit for that because he had worked with Brian May and Alice Cooper and a lot of people, and he had drum techs. But when he came back, went back to Kiss, I was the first guy he called, and I I respect that. So a lot. that that was my my decision. You know, it was the situation I was in in my life at the time, and you know I don't reg well I do regret it, but. <laughs> You know, we we live with our decisions, and he's got a good tech now. Paul has just been wonderful for him. You know, I I think Eric after me, and he had another guy named Jeff Mann that, that did some of the Alice Cooper stuff with him. And actually, Eric and I reunited in 1999 New Year's. Alice Cooper had a little thing at his restaurant in uh, Phoenix, and he wanted his band to play. He wanted to play his own place New Year's Eve. It was a costume party, and it was the Millennium Party, and. Um, I, I drum tech for Eric one last time, uh, New Year's Eve, 1999. So that was my my last time with him, which was fun. You know, Eric's a good guy. So yeah, I um I would have loved to have done it again, but like I said, you know, we get to stations in our life, and you think you're making the right decision, and five years later, you think, well, I could have done that better. So, so back 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 to the 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 setup. So every night you're cleaning and polishing all of the kit. Everything, yeah, everything. Um, yeah, he used to have, a, I think, he used to have one ride symbol that I didn't touch because the finish was kind of off of it. And with certain symbols, they do sound better if you don't clean them. But I think that ride symbol was mm. it. Everything else had to be perfect because when those lights hit it, it had to really sparkle. And it did. You know, so, he always had, go ahead. I'm sorry, I, I, I don't mean to keep interrupting you. No, go ahead. Um, no, that's uh, What? Well, how long just typically does it take from start to finish for the whole stage to get set up on a traditional rock tour for the most part? You were saying that you were talking about the riggers coming in at 10 and all of that. How long? No, did they no, start no, at no, like 8 in the morning? And riggers are in at usually 6 or 7. No, I said back line at 10. Oh, okay. No. Oh, back riggers line at 10. 6 okay, or so 7. What they'll do is they'll, they'll – a lot. What, what has been done in recent years is the stage is on wheels. And actually, Kiss had a, a rolling stage when I was last with them. And they'll okay. start – that allows them to – once the motors are set, lighting can go and start building their stuff on the floor. 
and the stage is already pushed into the middle of the arena where the carpenters are building the set and the sound guys are starting to hang. So sound and lights are working around the stage, which is in the middle of the arena. They fly their stuff out. We push the stage back into place, and that saved hours right there. But it usually, if you start at 6 or 7, rigging takes usually about two hours. Then you've got lights or... Lights are usually in the air and starting to focus by about 11, sound in the air, making noise about 11, finishing touches by noon, 1 o'clock, and then we hit band gear, back line, usually okay. by 1, 2 o'clock, and the line check, and um, ready for the band by 4. So did the band so that, always sound check, or did you do sound checks for them every once in a while? Um, they, For the most part, if it was a doable thing, they would sound check. Uh Unfortunately, I'm I'm not really a drummer, and I you know I go up there and I learn some beats from Eric, and I can do a little bit. But there's you know a, a non drummer versus a drummer. There's a different hit. There's a different attack. But what I did have the good fortune of was having uh, support bands that were huge Kiss fans, and um, one of them was Trickster, and their their drummer Gus loved to get up on Eric's kit, and he and he had, he'd be there waiting. So. I just turned Gus loose on the drum kit, and he'd do a, nice, you know, a good proper sound check for the sound guys, and it helped everybody out, and he had a blast. So, so if 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 um, Gene, Paul, and Bruce were out there, Gus would be on the dr drums, maybe doing it, or no, would, would, would no, it, no, no. If, if the band sound checked, it was always all four of them. I guess what I'm saying always is, awesome. you know, when when I was with the band. I remember there would be times where it'd be like, "Wow, well, Ace didn't sh isn't there for sound check for whatever reason," and Tommy's s filling in for sound check. Yeah, on the on the tours wow, I did. How ironic it, it is was, that? <laughs> yeah, right. If you'd only known. Um, the tours I did, you know, it was it was either all four band or we would do it. It was there was never any. Okay. You know, there, Gus would not have been up there with Gene and Paul. No, that would never have happened. Okay. A couple of times I was up there with Gene and Paul, and, and to say I was nervous would be an understatement. You know, it's like, you know, that one beat kind of good, and you're trying to do it, and it's still sounding like the Energizer Bunny, but, you know, Gene and Paul are kind of dealing with it. And, you know, and then fortunately, here comes Eric, you know, ready to go. Thank God. So uh, you were there through the Revenge Tour, right? Yes. I did and Revenge in 92. And, and then the Revenge Tour ends, and they kind of they go into, well, I guess you could say the Convention Tour was the next proper thing, right? That was, which was a couple of, well, Alive 3 came out, which I think is significant. That came out in 93. But but they didn't, there there wasn't really a tour around Oh, oh no, no, no. No, I don't want to, I don't want the chronology to lose right. anything, because for me, uh, another one of my my fond memories was a live three because I remember riding my bicycle to the library where I when I was twelve and getting and borrowing Kiss Alive and then when Kiss Alive two came out I, I got it for Christmas and I remember reading the gatefold you know the two the double album and I knew every crew guy's name every and, and I always thought to myself man if they ever did an alive three that would be so amazing to be on that. And 15 years years later, I was. So for me, Alive 3 is a hugely important part of their chronology because it was a... a, a you were a, part of it. A, a goal. Yeah. yeah, it was a, a, yeah. a kid's goal yeah. that, that the adult made come true. Yeah. Um, but yeah, 93 was kind of quiet for them. 94, I know they did shows in South America, and I was out with Stone Temple Pilots. I couldn't do it. So then 95, I had just finished STP, and we did Australia and Japan. Uh, on stage sets that they'd already shipped over there. And I believe it was Kiss's first time in Australia in 15 years. That was amazing. It was also Kiss's first um, conventions. They right. did them in Australia right. first on our days off. And that was a, a cool thing, too. So we're playing multiple nights in arenas and then doing these conventions. And it was just it was mayhem. It was great. And, and Japan is awesome. It always is. And I love it there. So then that summer we did the, the proper convention tour. What, what, where what, what was your memories about those conventions in Australia? Meaning, did how, how do you remember them coming about? I understand you're not in the inner circle of the decisions being made for the band's directions. But do you remember at some point hearing the 
Well, yeah, you know, I think we're going to test the water type of thing at an off day in Australia, and let's just see what happens. Or was this, like, formally planned right from the beginning of the tour that there was going to be a convention on these off days? Oh, it was planned because the stuff was brought over. Road cases were built. It was planned. There was no – you don't transport those, those you know, amazing things that they brought you know, uh, haphazardly. So it was, uh, my opinion, it was very, very planned out. And I was unaware of it until we landed and they said, Oh, your day is off. You're working the convention, by the way. And I'm like, wow, that kind of ain't cool. But <laughs> well, you know, initially you say that. <laughs> yeah. Initially you say that, but then, you know, you do it and you're like, this is kind of cool. You know, I just touched Jean's costume from whatever year, you know, putting it on the, on the dummy or, or, you know, um, Peter's old drum kit with the mirror tile because I used to take care of that. And then you meet the kids and and one of the another Eric Singer moment was you know Eric and I both had Kiss collections. You had to, you know, you work for Kiss, you have to. Which some of the stuff I'd had since I was a kid. And if there was stuff I wanted, he'd go and he'd haggle for me. He'd be hanging around there in the afternoon as well with the vendors. It's like yeah, uh, Kenny Bar needs that uh, pail. What do you what do you hear? Drumsticks, autograph, whatever. And he would get me whatever I wanted. So it was, it was fun. That's a great. There's a lot of work that that was made into a really good time. Was it? Was then, it you know, let's say, what, was it known at that time that there was going to be a full U.S. convention tour? I think there were murmurings about it, but nothing official was said to us. I I think that at that time, they really didn't. This is my opinion. Uh, they really didn't know what was going to be next. And Australia and Japan were playing big buildings, playing to a lot of people, so I think they needed that. And I don't know if they had maybe hoped for something bigger in the States or if they had planned out the convention tour to be all they did. But, again, they did it in a brilliant way. They owned the sound, they owned the lights, and as far as T-shirt sales, they were like the biggest per-dollar unit of the whole summer. They smoked everything. Um, that tour was wildly successful, and I think they made as much as if they played arenas because of the way they set it up and the way they did it. Yeah, I mean, they they, they booked their own – they did everything, 100% everything. They did everything. Bo- booked it uh, all themselves. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And it, you know, there's, there's, there's so many things that they do, and you think, wow, that just – you know, I never saw that coming. So, you know, we've got a change in the music scene, and Kiss is still trying to find their footing, and we can't play arenas. And we're still out doing a whole different thing successfully and making not just the dollars, which are good. You're making a name and you're building on the brand. Like, you know, we're, we're causing mayhem in every city doing these hotel ballrooms. You know, again, it was newsworthy items in a lot of cities and it, it elevated the band again in a whole different direction. And they built a market where there wasn't one or where there had been a small one. Now, speaking of, point. of, um, changing of musical direction what are your remem- memories and thoughts of carnival of souls were you around for that recording i was not no i got it when it came out i have heard a few different versions of why it was released and how it was released but nothing nothing concrete that i would stand here and say this is what happened it um i think it's a good record that didn't get its chance it just kind of got put out there and just here you go so so while you were in the Kiss, so when did you officially leave working with Kiss and Eric? I built the sets for the reunion tour, and after the Weenie Roast, the very first gig, I made the decision. It, I was not, being as a set carpenter is a skill, and I just was not comfortable at that point. You know, we'd done a month of rehearsals and set up and done, done the Weenie Roast, and I was getting my ass kicked. I lost 30 pounds in a month, and it, it just was not a good fit. And I respected them for hiring me and giving me the chance because I know that was on Gene. But I wouldn't have made it that tour. So that, that's I, I, I was going to ask you, is that is that a testament to Kiss's loyalty in that Eric is not in the band anymore, and you were Eric's tech, and they still made an offer to you you know, to bring you back out. They thought enough of you to find a position. It's absolutely a testament to them because there were other people on the convention tour. One ended up working, doing t-shirts. You know, they, there were people, but also initially I was going to be Gene's base tech. And because I had done him a whole convention tour and he and I communicated the, the very same way. I knew 
what he needed sound wise and when even when we had to find a real acoustic bass for the uh, unplugged episode because we didn't use one all summer i knew what he wanted i knew i know gene i know the monster so had, initially had, had was, mike rush been with gene for quite a while before then at, at mike rush had been with bruce and then they made the change and mike rush was with paul and at that point i'm not sure what was going to happen but I was going to be Gene's bass tech, and then a decision was made because I, I think Gene was talked into it. I don't know. I wasn't in the room, but Mike's in L.A. He's an L.A. guy. Monetarily, he's here when we need him, so I think that that's why that decision was made and why I was offered the set carpenter job, which you know I took. It's, it's still a testament to them, and I, I appreciated it. And when, you know, we, we realized it wasn't a good fit, it was a mutual, you know, there was no hard feelings. This, not everything in the world works. We all know that. And, you know, part is friends and you walk away. Three days later, I was out guitar teching for Alice Cooper or playing with the Scorpions all summer and I had a great time. And, but you see, know, that's, I think that's, that's important to stop and take note of because Gene and Paul, I think at times take an awful lot of crap. But to hear the loyalty, I think that's a big deal. You know, pretty Absolutely. cool that they're, you know, yeah, you wouldn't so think I think that's would, great. They would know, you wouldn't think that they you know, even know about, well, we don't need that guy, but they know who's on the crew and they know who's got their back and who's, you know, 100% in the game. And like I said, there are other people that were offered jobs doing other things and, you know, it was um, more family than people would probably realize. So were, were Gene and Paul not in a position to tell Peter that, that Ken is going to be your tech? I think, I think that the idea was for everybody to be treated the way we'd want to be treated. Uh, Peter had had a guy who was with him for many years, and I, I think that a respectful decision was made to give him a chance. I also think that that was part of why I was out there. I think that had he not worked out, I'd have been slid over. But the production manager asked me after a week, and I said, the guy's good. He's you know, he's good to go. You don't need to worry with this guy. I mean, I easily could have sabotaged him and tried to squeeze the gig, but I don't work that way either. You know, karma's a bitch. So mm -hmm. Peter's guy was good, and, and that made Peter happy. And, you know, it's, it, it needed to be. You know, Peter needed his comfort zone, and that's only fair. I worked for Peter you know, at Unplugged, and he was a sweetheart. He was a gentleman. He was very thankful of anything I did for him. You know, how can you how can you disrespect someone like that? If he needs his guy, he needs his guy. I get that. Mm -hmm. So you know, just as Eric brought me in when it was his turn, Peter brought his guy, you know? Right. And that's right. That's like the full thing coming full circle. So when you know, as a KISS fan, having spent time um working in the inner circle with them, the reunion is happening, you know, you're at the weenie roast. What is your gut telling you? This is going to work. This is going to implode. Do you, are you are you are you going? Man, I can already feel that there's there's some tensions. Uh, there was a magic in the air, actually, and I couldn't wait for that first show. But you know, bear bear in mind, you know, we had done rehearsals in an aircraft hangar, loaded out, loaded into the weenie roast, and by you know show time at the weenie roast, we had been all up for about four and a half days, nonstop working. And we were exhausted, but even with the exhaustion, there was a magic in the air. There truly, truly was. And when that band hit the stage, I was actually laying behind the drums because I had a hand controller for the hydraulic walls. And the, I think it was the second song we started bringing those things up, and the place went insane. And you just, when, when Gene did God of Thunder that night, I was in the pit in front of him with um, the venting for the fog that came up. And I'm holding it up there, dodging blood. You know, it doesn't get better than that. It just doesn't. Well, yeah. So, so to to that point, you're a huge Kiss fan. How many times were you sitting there on stage with that logo behind you, or like you said, in front of the stage in the pit, going, "Holy crap! What am I doing?" That's exactly what I said too. Is like. How did that kid from Long Island end up here? You know, how many right decisions did I make and how much luck did I use up getting here? This is once in a lifetime op a chance. And, you know, I did the first show. You can never take that away. It was awesome. It was, you know, there was magic. There was definitely just 
the you know the stars lined up, the moon and the sun lined up, and it was all just perfect. It was, you know, I mean the the show had you know a couple of little technical things, but you, you have to overlook that. That's the heart and the soul of it were were there. The guys all played great, and it was the way it should be. Were you around um, any of the band members right after that first show? Do you recall anything about how they felt about it or, you know? No. I was not near them. Those guys were taken, you know, taken away back to wherever. And, you know, I'm sure they were very celebratory themselves. Just they got through it and it, went, it was well received. And I think at that time, Tiger Stadium's tickets had sold out in like 10 minutes or something. It was a world record. So I think they were feeling good. I mean, they walked off stage looking good, looking happy. Uh, they did it, you know. Every all four piece, all four car, all four wheels on the car went the same direction, and they won the race. That's that's my feeling. Hey, you on know, it. so how about within the within the crew, and and maybe it's just the immediate backline that that you're you're part of. Um, when that show was done, were you guys like, holy crap, this is going to actually work? This is going to explode. I think I wasn't on backline on that one, but I think that everyone involved at this point had the faith in the band to know all, that it was going to go already. Uh, the rehearsals, there was a feeling. Everybody was working hard, and there was just a feeling that it was going to go out, and it was going to be a, the monstrously huge tour that it was. I, I think that just seeing it, seeing it built from the ground up in the aircraft hangar, you had to believe, and we all did, you know? Um, do you I mean, think we're all believers? Do you think it's possible for them to get that magic back? I think if you can get the four guys in good health on that stage, the magic is there. The magic is them. So could it, could it happen again? I believe it does. It could. I, that's my belief. I think that just as it was resurrected once, it could be again. I think that whatever the reasons, I won't say the reasons because I wasn't there, but whatever the problems are, if we could work them out, you know, maybe one more time, even if it was just like a one-off pay-per-view or something, I'd, I'd pay for it. I'd pay to see it. Um, but you know, but, they'd have to be able to perform at the level Kiss is at now. You know, they're raising the bar every year with Tommy and Eric. So definitely. the originals would have magic, but they'd have to be spot on as well. Do you, but do you think that there's some, potential serious personality conflicts that have to be overcome or that might not be possible to overcome at this point? I think, you know, I think as, as we all get older, grudges aren't so important. Would it hurt feelings kind of, you know, go away? And if you have the chance to do that, they all knew what it felt like to come back from where they were to stand on that stage at Tiger Stadium and own the world. You know, that's a high that none of us will ever feel. You know, owning the world, the top of the world, Kiss the Tiger Stadium, it didn't get any bigger. They're the biggest thing on the planet that day. I, if it was me, I'd want it back. I'd want another chance to do that one more time, you know. Um, right. I think that I think that we're all grown-ups. I think – I believe that it could happen. I mean, that you know, I could be totally wrong, but I'm a believer. So what do you think of the possibility that uh, Kiss is going to continue on without Gene and Paul? It's going to be four – brand new guys who were never original members you know i can i can see it happening like a cirque du soleil type thing you know uh can gene and paul go on no one can go on forever do we want that yeah we do that their tour right now is kicking ass so if they got to a point they'd have to find people that were spot on i think it, it's an interesting notion and again i would pay to see it just to see it um I mean, I can I, I can see something like that, you know. Uh, Gene used to have an assistant named Spiro that would do him so perfect you couldn't tell the difference. Oh yeah, yeah. And yeah. you know, if it, go ahead. No, no, I was just I was agreeing. No, we were just agreeing. Spiro is, you know, when Spiro gets into makeup, you can't tell the difference. Exactly. So you know, there's other Spiros out there. There's Paul Stanley. You know, could do could be is out there too. We just have to find them. It, would it be cool? Yeah. Would it be the original? Would it be Kiss at all? That's a that's a gray area. I mean, you know, right. I we had um, where I work, we had a uh, foreigner play, which is Mick Jones and you know a bunch of other guys, all new guys, and 
And but Mick was sick, and somebody had filled in for him. Yeah. So there was not an original foreigner on that stage, and the joke at work was, "That's Gene Simmons' wet dream." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's collecting collect money. money. He's not even have... there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I, I think it's an interesting notion. You know, that fifty years from now, somebody could see what we have seen. I think it's a cool thing. Do I hope they do it? Absolutely. I, if it, it ever gets to a point where Gene and Paul can't do it or don't want to do it, I hope they have, you know, I hope they make that decision. Hey, let's make this a, you know, a, 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 a Cirque du Soleil or let's do a, you know, whatever with it, but let's keep it going. Before we wrap up here, and I'll give Tommy a chance to ask any other questions he's got, there's, it, it's always been, there's, you know, not notorious, but funny stories about end of tour shenanigans, opening bands, support bands, headliners, you know, that the crews come out and do, you know, there's that famous story that, that Rush came out and threw marbles all over the stage when they were supporting I kids. That, yeah. Um, anything like that when you were on the road? Yeah, but yeah. Kiss <laughs> had, the, had a long-standing law does not happen. They do not go for that, period. But uh, it wasn't the end of the tour, but halfway through the tour, Faster Pussycat lost their tour support and had to go home. And their last night, they all dressed as women and got past our security guy for, I don't know if it was for take it off or if it was for whatever. They got up there in drag and it was not well received. It was not a pretty picture. <laughs> I just saw some evil looks from Gene to the security and they were all ushered out of there pretty quickly. You, you were going, I know there's going to be some meetings discussing this post show. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, the, the crew had already sent the runner out to get um, job applications at McDonald's and Burger King. And we papered their dressing room wall with those applications. So, <laughs> I, you know, I guess the crew deserves Excellent. something. It's just Kiss didn't okay, deserve Okay, so, so, so there's a longstanding rule that you don't do that to Kiss. How about you guys doing it to support acts? Is that the same rule? I don't know. Support acts are open. open uh, so did you game. ever do anything to a support act? You know, not really. Uh, I don't believe in it. I mean, we're here to see a show, you know. A lot of people save money for a long time. Um, I think the only support act I ever did anything to, when I was out in Alice Cooper for a while, we had Danger Danger, and I had known those guys since their first demos. And I think I had a basket of rolls. I bounced off Ted Poley's head while he was singing whatever song. Uh, it just, for whatever reason, we all had a bunch of rolls that day, and it's, it was the thing to do. Tommy, any last questions? Um, yeah. Since you worked with most of the band members, the ones that you've spent time with, including Eric, um, what would you want people, fans, to know about each one of them? Like we talked about the loyalty factor that maybe some people aren't aware of or don't believe. What can you share with us about each member that you've encountered on a very regular basis and got to know? Um, that's a tough one. Uh well, the loyalty factor, the Gene, Gene appreciating hard work, you know, like I said, he has given me compliments and you do your job, you shut your mouth and do your job, you're golden. Um, as far as the band, but there is the loyalty we discussed, you know, I remember when they were doing the announcement at uh, the, was it the Intrepid? I don't want to misspeak. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I was there. I was one of the two guys holding the curtain. You know, we were, we walked that curtain open, and I was behind there. And there's the four guys, you know, and Paul Stanley, full makeup, full rock star. You know, he's about to make an announcement that's earth shaking, and the lights are dim, and we're getting, we're waiting. And he looks over and he goes, "Hey, Ken Barr," and I'm like, and me and the other guy, Todd, just looked at each other, I was like, "Yeah, that Paul Stanley in makeup remembers me." <laughs> it was that's awesome. Cool. Very yeah, cool. it was. It was. You know, they they appreciate good. You know, they appreciate people that do right by them. They're good, they're good people. You know everything I've said. I mean, I don't. I can't be more specific than that. They're just they're good people. They're loyal well, and, people. You do right by them. You're in. Well, and and the reason is I wasn't trying to back you into a corner, but I'll give you a perfect example. And Mike and I were wavering on talking about this, but I'm going to bring it up. Oh, you can uh, talk to me day, about anything. Let's throw well, that out there. Anything's fair game. Okay. Well, Mike posted something on our Facebook page the other day that Paul had tweeted. Someone asked the question. If Eric Carr 
had lived, would he have still been in the band? And I don't remember what it was. Five words that Paul five used. Five words he said. Yeah. Pro- um, probably not for many reasons. That was it. And people went freaking berserk. And it's the reason I say this is because so many are, are so quick to say shame on you, Paul. And he just answered a question honestly. So this is yeah. what I'm looking for from you. Is is it's nice to hear you say that they appreciate hard work, they appreciate loyalty, they know who has their back. Because some of these fans, I just think, get way out of line in taking five simple words and blowing it into yeah. this thing that's just not even it's realistic. Not there. It's not there. They're making no. something yeah. up. And, and we don't know what the reasons were. I mean, you can't do a reunion tour and have someone, you know, it could have been that. It could have been so many things that weren't negative, and, but people take everything. You, if you're the least bit vague, they'll, they'll take the negative side to it and go on the attack. It's crazy. I mean, right. Paul is a good guy. He's got a good heart, you know, and I I'm sure it was the best of intentions that he said that, that he was, you know, he, he released that statement. So, you know, they, I mean, I've never heard a bad thing said about Eric Carr. They love that guy and he loved Kiss. So whatever reasons he, if, for, if he wouldn't have been involved, they were outside of that. They weren't his playing because he was a great player. It wasn't his attitude. He loved the band. So, you know, sometimes there are extraneous things and we're not privy to it and we don't need to be. You just, you know, if you believe in Kiss, if you believe in Paul Stanley, you take him at his word and I respect that. it and move on. Very well said. That's excellent. Awesome. Well, so, so, um, just so to remind everybody who has stuck through this hour long chat, your book. I can is, talk. <laughs> your book is called. No, oh, love it. It's been great. We are the Road Crew. And you can get by it at, Ken Barr. And you can get it at Amazon. It's Kindle, iTunes. iTunes, iTunes, and uh, Audible dot com. Yeah, I did a, we did an audio book last year. So um, yeah, it's available any way you want it. You can have it. And Just you, like might, the you song. mentioned you would like to any do another, you want it. You got another book. Well, how how I likely would. is that? Um, you know, you have to build the market to, and right now. We Are the Road Crew has done okay. I would love to do one dedicated to all my time with Kiss, all my time with Alice Cooper. Little details, a lot more pictures. You need to build a market. What, you know, what, what, I would actually, the, what would the possibility be of, as you kind of mentioned, getting other crew members to contribute? I would love, you know, every crew guy that I've ever met has always said, I'm going to write a book about what I've done because every, what every one of us go out there and do is, is a once in a lifetime opportunity. You want to share right. that, but you also want to remember it. You don't want to start, Hey, what was that? So what I would love to do is, is have them contribute an anecdote or two. And if they would like my involvement in, in figuring out how to get their story onto paper, I'd be glad to help. I've offered with a lot of guys it's a, a, an overwhelming experience when you first sit down and say, I'm going to write a book. You know, I took my tour itineraries 20 years worth and put them on the kitchen counter, and it took me a year to get through them all and get them finally off the counter. And, you know, formatting it and how do I want to tell the story? I chose what a lot of people have said, and it's what I intended, was like you're sitting on the bar stool next to me listening to stories. That's how I wanted it to be. It's not Hemingway. It's not Walt Whitman by any means. But it's comfortable and it's me. Um, actually, yeah. I had talked to somebody when I, I was originally trying to get an audio book deal, uh, which I ended up just self doing it on my own. Always the best way, by the way. Okay. Um, I talked to audible.com and I proposed the first ever live audio book. And what we were going to do was go to a bar where I hang out, sit in a booth, eat and drink and tell the stories. And as I got drunker, just let the stories be drunker. <laughs> so. Perfect. And it would be the first ever live audio book, so I still haven't done it, but it's it's on the that's, back that's burner somewhere. That's where you'll get the great Gene Simmons stories. Yeah. Yeah, and the bad impersonations <laughs> and the cackling laugh that's worse than Aces. Oh, yeah, you get all of that. That's all in the wings. They're coming one day. Ken, this was awesome. Uh, yes, I thank you so much. Well. Yeah, this is the oh, type thank of, you for having this me. Is, this, this is the type of stuff that I, as a fan, just love. I'm just... I, I love dealing with road crews. I mean, the time that I spent with the band, you know, I might fly out for a weekend and cover a bunch of shows, but to just sit like up in the arena and watch the crew work 
it just yeah. it you know i think it's something that so many fans don't understand the the amount of work the precision of a mobile army that is yeah. in place to put this show in up perform tear down get out and get to the next town by 6 a.m the next morning and do it all over again oh yeah it's it's freaking amazing to sit here and watch these crew members do this stuff and you know for people who are like on the back line you got there there's no do-overs when you're in the middle of a concert no nope. you're it, in the hot seat you're in the hot seat and depending on who your band is you that hot seat could get awfully freaking hot if you screw up oh yeah so, oh yeah you know it's I, I just i just need to stress that it's just like people shouldn't take for granted the crew and the work that they do because they really do it, i mean without the crew it doesn't happen and Plain the thing and too is and the thing too is i've heard the exist expression the dumb roadie you know the thing to keep in mind is a lot of the innovations in technology in entertainment have come from road crew guys or former road crew guys intelligent lighting audio the stuff they do with audio now uh you know some of the engineering involved look at kiss's lighting that's engineering that's that's like the kind of people that do bridges and yeah. and stuff yeah so so you're talking about an amazing level of technology that these guys are on the forefront of so you know that phrase dumb roadie really doesn't apply to people that are doing what we're what they're doing these days you know so people don't realize that, but I think it's important that they do. These guys are making contributions to the world, you know, sound-wise, audio-wise, you know, the video, lighting. I mean, it's 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 incredible I mean, what those guys do. Let, let's 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 be real. I mean, Kiss is going to get up on stage and put everything into giving you the best show possible, but that best show possible doesn't happen without the crew putting everything together, making sure it all works, making sure all the pieces are ready. Because yeah. if it was just left up to four guys in the band, you're basically going to have bar stools and acoustic guitars, and that's it. Yeah. What, one quick thing um, before I go also. You, you said you read the book, right, uh, Michael? Yeah, it's been a while, but I read it when it first came out. Well, there was there's a story in there about when I was at my first time in Australia, and I'm passed out and almost missed my plane call and the Australian lighting guy kicked my door in, got me up and out. That was Motley who has been Kiss's LD for the past few tours. Okay. Sean Hackett. I, I toured with him in 89 when he was just a lighting crew guy in Australia and now he's one of the best LDs out there because his show is amazing. Very yep. cool. Yep. And, it, and, and, you know, can... and it, it's exhausting work what you guys do because oh, you, absolutely. You know, you're, oh. you're, you're sleeping on buses, you're you, strange you hours. Learn to, you learn to thrive on it, though. You really do. You know, I, I have often said that like the perfect vacation plan for ex road crew guys would be to go ride the bus for a week. As I would pay to do that, eat catering. You know, eat, hang out in the concrete building all day. You know, it's I'd miss it. I would pay. I'd pay money to go on that vacation. You plan. know, it's it's funny when when Kiss first started their VIP meet and greet packages years ago. Um, I was working with the band and put those together and launched them. We had a company, and I can't remember what the name of them were. They were probably somewhere out of, I want to say, Nashville that approached us and said, what if we sell the fans the ability to ride a tour bus? Yeah. We, put a, we get a tour bus, and we put 10 fans in there, and you get to caravan along with the crew. You'd go three shows. You eat in catering. And, and I was just like, I know fans would f jump all over it. The problem is, financially, it was just tough to make it work because oh, you, yeah, you, sure. could you could only do so. You can't, you can't put 50 people in a tour bus. <laughs> yeah. You can put 10 people in a tour bus, and you got to charge them an astronomical fee. And then there's also the, well, the real crew doesn't want this fan crew. Hanging yeah, out right. everywhere you get because you're you've got a job to do. You're not here to entertain well, ten fans. And yeah. that and that and that gave me another question I wanted to ask. Um, taking off from what you were saying, Mike, when you all travel together, who travels where? Like the the road crew, whether it be you or any of the other guys you work with. Do you guys also ride on the bus? Do you ride in a truck? Do when do you sleep? So like if the the back line comes in at 
whatever time. I mean, are they sleeping during the show and then they just show up after the show? Do you only get six hours of sleep a night? How? What's that schedule? Well, the truck drivers, the idea is to get their trucks unloaded so they can go to the hotel and sleep. They sleep by day. The okay. rest of the crew, we get, you know, there's a, a there's a bus that's usually got the production bus, the production manager, the stage manager, the rigger. They're on their own bus. You've got a lighting bus, a sound bus, back line with wardrobe and whoever else. And depending on the tour, you just add to that, you know, two lighting buses or three. But crews that work together are on the same bus so that they arrive together. So that on the day off, when the buses pick you up at the hotel, lighting will go, you know, at seven o'clock, band gear will go in at nine, that type of thing. And okay. as far as sleep, you get what you can. Sometimes it's four hours, sometimes it's five, sometimes not so much because it was a long night loading out. And you just kind of deal with it. And on the day off, you just collapse. My, so then um, on your, go ahead, I'm my sorry. big thing on the day off, was to be on my bed in my hotel room at 435 because that's when Andy Griffith came on TBS and I'd have a club sandwich and fries from from uh, room service. That was my depressurization. Perfect. So then on days off, like if you had two days off in Oklahoma City, you guys would all stay in the same hotel and they'd divvy you up in rooms by the crews you work with and then you were free well, to do whatever you wanted to do on your day off or what, you know. My years on the road, we all got our own room, and it just okay. it was whatever rooms they put you in. And, yeah, on your day off, it's whatever you want to do, and, you know, you're, you're given a bus call the, the morning of the show, what time to be in the lobby. And if you are not able to make bus call, you will get what we refer to as oil spotted. The bus absolutely will not wait for you. If it's 8 o'clock, the bus is rolling, and oil spotting is when you go out to where the bus used to be, and all you see is the oil spot where it used to be. <laughs> and... They will oil spot you, and you will get yourself to the gig, whether it's a $100 cab ride or whatever it is. And if you don't get yourself to the gig, you're going to be going home. That's that stuff they take very seriously. It's too much of a precision mis machine to, to do a setup to wait around for some guy that couldn't get his ass out of bed in the morning. Now, how, often so then, does, how often does that happen? Once a tour with a new guy usually, and when they realize that we're not kidding – it usually becomes very real and doesn't happen anymore. And so what are, are, they are, the, are there second chances? No, you miss your gig. You're, you're typical. Uh, I, I guess there may be, but I've never seen a second chance. If you miss bus call and don't get yourself to the gig, you're pretty much up shit's creek. Now, is that going to um, hurt you in trying to get gigs with other bands? Does that follow Absolutely. you all over? Absolutely. You are, you know, being good at your job is a, a big component of what is important. But, you know, you're known by your reputation. Okay. Is this guy a pain in the ass to live with on the bus? Is he up late, you know, with the stereo blast? And is he a pain? You know, it, you can be the best technician. If you're a pain in the ass to live with, no one will have you. And your rep, it's not, it's not by resumes you get jobs. It's by reputation. Hey, I know this guy. Oh, yeah, he's great. Oh, but he's a pain in the friggin' ass. No. And, and you know, you got to watch that. So, what? okay, let's say you have a day off. I'm sorry, we're just spinning on more stuff, but this is so interesting That's to fine. me. That's fine. That's, what, all, that's why I'm here. Okay. Go ahead. Well, okay, so let's say there's a day off in Oklahoma City again, and that's the next show. What, what do you do with all the gear? Do they take it to the um, arena and then you have a guard watching all the trucks or how do they protect everything when you have that time off or do they load it in or what do they do? It de it de well, we don't load it in. You don't load it in until show day because otherwise you'd be paying for security inside, outside, and double stage hands. Okay. Uh, if you can get your trucks, if it's an arena tour, if you can get your trucks into the arena, then you back them in and they just sit there if there's nothing there the day before. If Otherwise, it's up to the truck drivers to find secure parking. Sometimes the hotel will provide secure parking. Uh, otherwise, they have to find a place. That's on the truck drivers to find a secure lot to put their trucks. But I would, so as, I would assume the, the, the professional truck drivers know instantly, ah, I'm rolling into Oklahoma City and I know exactly yep. where to go. Oh, they've right. got their list of every town and, okay, you use this lot or, you, or the – or the promoter will let us do this or that. Yeah, that's all. These guys have been doing it forever. Okay. Cool. Cool. Interesting Anything stuff. Anything else, Tommy? I know I'll think of something after we hang up, but... <laughs>
<laughs> this has been great. This again. We I'm can all do it about again. This yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, this was great. This was great. And I'm sure we're going to have fans hit us up with, why didn't you ask them about this? So, well, just tell them we'll do it. That's, we're saving that for the next one. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And, and for all of you listening, it's hard for Mike and I to come in and do this because there's so many cool things, and and Ken's been so wonderful about sharing. You start thinking about all these other things, and it it's hard to. We don't go with a script, as you know. This is a low budget, no budget production. Yeah. yeah. There's That's no, what there's, I live for. There, there was no pre-approved I, questions from Ken here. We were just. Flying by the seat it. of our pants. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's, that works out best. That's organic. That's real to do yeah, it that way. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's why so, I said if you guys want to do it again, I'm all for it. I I like doing this stuff because, you know, there were there were some of the best days I've ever had, and I loved it. So well, I'll talk. I'll talk. Yeah. Ask anybody that knows me. I'll talk your ear off. We need. You know That's what? We, what would be fun to put together is a road crew roundtable. That'd cool. yeah, so that would couple, be cool. you know, like Tommy and I, but then you and one or two other crew members. Well, then they don't even necessarily have to be from Kiss, but just because then all of a sudden you guys are feeding off each other as well. You're gonna hear a lot of laugh and a lot of stories. Yeah, that's yeah. that's a cool idea. Yeah, yeah, that would be fun. Get a Google hang, like be, a Google Hangout. It'll be kind of like after the catch with the the captains from Deadliest Catch. It'll be we'll be the exactly, captains. Exactly. Exactly. Perfect. By there you go. Means. Let's 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 yeah, think that would about be how fun. to do that. Let's, let's think about yeah, how to do that. Yeah, let's try to figure that out. That would be a lot of fun. Yeah. I would enjoy that. If you uh, um, want, so, you know, I can send you, you know, guys that would be interested if you want, if you, you know, don't have people in yeah, mind no, already. No, no, so you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go offline and, yeah, we'll see how we can put something together here. That would be really Well, and we want it to be people you know, you know. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah, and yeah, one last yeah. thing. Are you, are you working – at all right now on any tour or you got anything in the works that you're going to be heading out on the road? I left the road in 2000. I've done a few one-offs here and there and I've focused on, on my writing. I've actually got 10 books on Amazon. I've okay. got a couple of short movies. I've, I've started to do that. And uh, an old road friend, I'm, I miss doing shows. I, I really do. Uh, I have a job that allows me eight weeks off a year. So I might start doing some of those cruise ships. Uh, oh, my, yeah, uh, an old friend go. of mine, an old friend of mine, talked to me about doing seventy thousand tons of metal in January as stage manager. And yep. I actually just this past weekend sent my re- my resume to the company that does all the other ones. And you know I'm available, so you know hopefully one of them will take me up on it. I go you out and stage. Up, you manager. might end up on the Kiss cruise with Eric. That yeah. would be awesome. I would love that. Yes, yeah, Sixth Man is the company that does that, and right. they're the one of the companies I contacted. So, yep. you know, for me it works because it, it would be more like what I said earlier. I'd like a vacation on the road, like riding the bus. Well, I can ride the cruise ship and do stage manager, whatever is needed, and do that for a five-day cruise and, and, you know, feel like I'm back to my roots. So, uh, one, one real quick parting question. Back when you were touring, like, with Kiss in 92, how much would you have loved – to have residencies happening back then. So you just set up at one one arena in Vegas and you're there for three weeks. You know, I never did good with multiple nights. Uh, I tend to be a little OCD. And for me, a show day is a show day. I need to be at the arena. So if it was a residency, I would probably be, whatever time they open the theater, if they, whenever they let me in, I'd be up on the drum riser fiddling around for six hours. But, but of course, but it would... I guess the point is the 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 stress the work on you would be less because you don't have the traveling there's no tearing tearing down and setting up it's it's you're not now you just set up once and then worry about the details every day you know I I fed off the energy of the load out the load in the the whole everything the residencies I'd have done them but they would have been tough so it's a ritual yeah it's it's totally the ritual that's it exactly. You know, we do like I said, I do multiple nights, and the second day you're sitting around ten in the morning. I feel lazy. It's like I should be doing something. Do you think a so, lot of crew guys feel that way? I think so. I think you kind of get into a, a pattern, and you're just used to it. And you break someone's pattern, it's hard. You know, at least for me. So I bet you. I mean, I'm sure a lot of guys enjoy it, but I'm sure there's guys like me out there that are like. You know, it's, it's like like Rain Man. You know, ten minutes to ten minutes to stage, ten minutes to stage. I just, I'm the Rain Man of rock and roll, I guess. So, so something. Ten just minutes, hit, Sandy Griffith. Something just hit. Yeah, me, ten you minutes, know. Sandy Griffith. We we we, we we've been <laughs> saying, you know, 
the road guys, the other guys, how many women are in this field? There are some, and there's getting to be more and more. You'll see them on the lighting crews. Uh, it used to just be production assistant, but I've seen them on lighting crews. Um, I worked with a woman, Suzanne Seidel. She was a ground rigger for Aerosmith for like 15 years and really good at it. She did the Kiss Revenge Tour. Uh, that's hard work, and she was really good at it. So you're seeing more and more. And I think as, as the, the industry grows and there's more jobs and there's just more functions out there, you know, like Kiss carries – just to do what they do, so many people, it's 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 a big endeavor. It's like their own art. Well, the Kiss Army, there we go. Right. Um, so, yeah, you're going to see more and more, I think. I really do. The more women are getting into it, and they're doing well at it. Cool. Ken, Interesting. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. This was a lot thank of Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Very us. cool. Thank very you. Cool stuff. You can uh, send me links to this when you're ready? Yep, yep. When, this yep. will go up um, next Tuesday. So okay. it, I'll send you links. It'll be on YouTube, iTunes. It'll be everywhere. Awesome. So I'll send you links to all of it. I appreciate it. And like I said, you do it again or the roadie roundup or whatever. I'm all for that too. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be in touch over email and we'll see what we can figure out here. Awesome. Yeah, well, thank you guys. I, I would love it. Time. All right. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Ken. Thank Bye. you. Take care. I love that. I love that. That was. I just I that, felt that. that, that we just, I just kept coming up with ideas and questions. That was my and... minutia. That was my mm -hmm. minutia show. Mm -hmm. Very much so. I thought it. I thought he was very interesting, very well spoken, easy to talk to, and I, I think there's so much more there too that we should be asking. Yeah, yeah. I, I would love to try and put together that road crew roundtable. That would be fun. Get some other road crew members on and, and talk about this stuff. It's just, I don't know. I'm just more amazed by the road crew than I am by other aspects of. Of Kiss, you know the producers yeah. are cool, the songwriters are cool, the ghost musicians, all right, that's cool. But I don't know, it's just the, the road crew members. I feel like those are the ones that they they spend so much time close to the band and the fans that there's so much that they experience and can talk about. Right, I agree, and and I like to hear those things that we don't normally get to talk about. Yeah, yeah. you know, they so, see it from the inside out. We need to come up with some homework, and it should be road crew related. Um, hmm. That's a tough one. Maybe uh, what question would you like to ask? Yeah, if you, if, if you were able to sit down with a road crew member, what kind of question would you ask? And maybe something along the lines of if you could be a road crew member, what would you want to do? Who would you want to be a tech for? Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Tell us what you think. Tell us what you think. Um, you can leave your homework questions on facebook.com slash three sides of the coin, three sides of the coin dot com, youtube dot three sides of the coin dot com, spreaker dot three sides of the coin dot com. Um, Anywhere we have commenting available, we're pretty much all over the place checking them. So, yep. um, yeah, come in and leave your homework. Let us know what you think. That'd be great. And I think that's it. Okay. There somewhere, you go. somewhere in this show, we had another piece of merchandise from Mark. It's always a surprise because we don't know. Yeah, he never tells us. He never tells what us. He, re he records it and just sends a video over. So. Um, I never know what it's going to be until I'm editing the video and I drop it in and go, wow, that's pretty freaking cool. Yeah. Have we named it yet? I'm, I, I like the this isn't Spencer's crap, but I don't know if we should use the Spencer's name. Okay. All right. Well, then we'll have to come up with something else because I like that. You know? I don't know. If you guys got some cool names, keep giving us suggestions. Nothing's really kind of... Collect, yeah. yeah, we want something funny, not something like God of Thunder Collector. All right, yeah. it's got to be something snappy, you know, something hey, really cool. Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> not in a lounge lizard way, just, you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Perfect. 
I took okay. heat, I took heat for you saying yes on that last show. Somebody on YouTube you was tell, somebody was like it was very disrespectful of me to make you say yes. <laughs> it's just like you realize it's a joke, don't you? Yeah, no, people don't get it. No, they don't. So. They don't get a life. Get a life. Yeah, it's all good. It's all good. Um, oh, hey, by the way, we are um, still working on Vegas. We think we've mm -hmm. got a date picked out that we're going to be there. I don't want to say anything yet because we're trying to confirm um, a location to hold a recording the day after the show. So hopefully we'll have something in the next week or so that we can announce. That would be fantastic. Be fun. Be fun to get together and just meet some people. I guess if nothing mm -hmm. else happens, we can all just go to the hotel room and have a kiss party. Oh. <laughs> that just sounds weird. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, nothing, nothing weirder than what's happened on this show in eight episodes. That's true. As long as Terrence shows, doesn't show up, everything's cool. Oh, Terrence is going to be the special MC, <laughs> dude. If we but really, if we, to, if, if we won't be able to talk because Katy Perry's sitting on his if, face. If we really had a freaking budget, I would so love to fly Terrence in to introduce oh. us. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe oh. we get Terrence to record an introduction and we can just play it over the PA. You probably can't even believe it. Terrence, we know you're watching. <laughs> yeah. You hate us, but we know you're watching. Give us a call. <laughs> give, give us a call. Leave us a message. Would you do? Would you record an intro for us? That'd be fantastic. We're going to make you as famous as the, the uh, kiss introduction. You wanted the best, you got the best. We need Terrence to be that for us. That'd be cool. I'd love it. All right, that's it, guys. Till next week. <sighs> oh, out of here. Cool. Get it? <laughs> no. One, two, three. We're out of here. <laughs> three. <laughs> We gotta have our little gang symbol. Oh, okay. I'll, we'll have to work on one that's better than that. That's not tough enough. <laughs> I'm gonna get that one. Bye. Two in the pink, one in the stink. <laughs> Later. Bye. Hey, Three Sides fans, Mark Chikini here from Detroit Rock City. And uh, the other day when I was on uh, Three Sides with uh, Tommy and Mike, I talked about how my mother was pretty supportive of my uh, kiss habit and um, also how I had uh, some people that we knew that uh, thought that kiss were bad guys. Anyways, I uh, want to show a kind of a cool collectible. I know people have asked me for it in the past, and I do have it, and I'm going to show it to you in a minute. But first, uh, I want to show you the reason why. And uh, this is from, let me see if you can get a good shot. This is from 1979. This came out of, uh, matter of fact, it was February 5th, 1979, from the Detroit News. And uh, Dick Kleiner was a writer, and it says, Dear Dick, we have heard from certain reliable and truthful sources that the rock group KISS has certain ties with the devil. And it goes on from there. But like I said, uh, they started with the uh, KISS as the Knights and Satan, Satan Service. Uh, here's another one. This is from 1983, and uh, this is why it's relevant. Yeah, I know they use stock pictures from uh, back uh, from the 70s, but it, uh, it's from October 18th of 1983. And uh, what I'm going to bring up is uh, the fundamentalists were really trying to hype um, Kiss was a bunch of bad guys. And anyways, there was a, they had books like this, and here's where it gets kind of interesting. <clears throat> they had uh, an interview with uh, Gene, and, and I'm going to show you. I hope I can catch this on the Skype here. Uh, all right, I can't tell if, uh, if this is good or not, but I hope, hope it is. If you can see what that preacher's holding, that's a cassette. Well, look, here we go. Uh, I happen to have that very cassette there i am and here it is here's a copy of it it's pretty funny it's called kiss exposed and uh it's kind of one of the reasons cool is that he's at a concert 
in uh, the preachers are in um, in Minnesota, 1983. And uh, <laughs> as he's as he's talking about the band, uh, they're doing the introduction to Cold Gin, and as uh, you know, Paul's uh, doing his rap, and the crowd's yelling Cold Gin, Cold Gin. Uh, the preachers are saying into their recorder on that tape that, all right, look at listen to what they're telling them. the kids are all ch chanting cocaine, cocaine. So you know, obviously they didn't know the songs. So uh, anyways, it goes downhill from there. But if you get a chance, this is a pretty cool collectible. Um, like I said, it's a uh, a tape that was re released by a, a religious, and I say that with a grain of salt, with a, a religious group. But it's pretty funny. I've been asked about it a lot. Hopefully you guys dug that little story, and we will talk to you later. Have a great one, guys. Get your three sides of the coin t-shirts, now available and shipping worldwide. Order at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. For interviews and media inquiries, contact Izzy at IzzyPresleyProductions.com. Download your free ebook by Michael Brandvold called Kiss School of Marketing, 11 Lessons I Learned While Working with Kiss. Available for free at Noisetrade.com slash Michael Brandvold.